Good stuff, amen. I'm telling you what, it, it was always fun to be in worship, uh, even when you weren't here. But man, I'm telling you, it's a lot more fun having you here, amen. Because I'm not the only one out there singing. And the praise team probably welcomes that, uh, that uh, some feedback from you with that as well. But man, it is great to see all of you here. Great to have you join us. All those join us by live stream. Thank you again for coming. And my friends, it's, it's exciting to finally be together. Amen. It is good to have you here. Uh, I, I want to look today at celebrating the Lord. That's basically what this is all about. Celebrating the Lord. Let me get my there. We've been an immature church and celebrating the Lord because that's, that's what we're doing here. Amen. Do you realize that worship service is a celebration? And we need to, I think, as, a, as, as, if, as if we don't grow up too much, as I've been talking about over the last uh, several weeks, about being in that immature church, growing up too much, kind of losing some of that childlike faith, that innocence, uh, that joy, because we're burdened bound down by stuff and by expectations. But we are here, and we need to understand that we are called to celebrate Jesus Christ. And what I want to look today is the, the idea in 2 Samuel chapter 6. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to be looking at the idea of worshiping and the idea of not worshiping. And I want to look today at this text to, uh, to share a message that God has laid on my heart about, again, being that immature church and celebrating the Lord. Why don't you stand with me in honor of reading God's Word? As I shared in the first service, man, that sounds good to get to say, amen? Stand with me, all of you. Oh, praise the Lord. we got people here that can do it. Let's read starting at verse 12. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him. Because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. And so it was then that those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that he sacrificed oxen and, and uh, fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all of his might and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with the shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Now, as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord, Lord of hosts. Then he distributed among the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both women and, men, and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed to enter everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today. Of course, she wasn't meaning it. Uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, and as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. So David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, but will be humbled in my, in my own sight. But as for the maid servants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you again for allowing us to be a part of this service this morning, and thank you for... Just a great time of praise and worship that we've been given. And Lord, I pray today that you would guide us and encourage us through everything that we're doing. And Lord, I pray that the words I'm about to say will be your words and not mine, that this is your message and not mine as well. And also, Lord, that the response would be from here in this congregation and everyone watching would be as you desire for it to be. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Man, I want to take just a moment again and welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. And I want to thank just very quickly all the staff and all the volunteers who have helped put this thing together. The staff has done an incredible job. The deacons and all of our, our leadership, Sunday school leaders and small group leaders, everyone has done an, an amazing job keeping our church together, keeping our church uh, caring and, and ministering and, and just going throughout all of our business. And we haven't stopped ministering because uh, the building was shut down. Amen. So thank you to all the staff and all the leadership 
uh, even today, making this possible. Man, it took a lot of planning. Uh, we've got more to do. We're going to uh, make sure that everyone feels secure when they come into this place. But again, thank you uh, to everyone who's worked so hard and all the volunteers and greeters um, uh, this morning as well. Today, I want to talk about what this text really is all about. And, and this, is, this is what I want us to look at. This text, as many people t- at times read this, and this is where we kind of get some idea of, of, well, yeah, you're not supposed to be dancing because we dance before the Lord, and we're not supposed to be doing that. This text isn't about dancing. And this text isn't about streaking, amen? Uh, a lot of people say this is what David was doing, and, and David was streaking before the Lord and dancing before the Lord. Here, I'm, I'm here to tell you that that's not what David did, and we're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes, because I want you to know if David was streaking out in front of all the people, God would not have been pleased, amen? So if any of you get the idea from reading this text that as soon as church is over, you're going to run out of here, you're going to streak and before the Lord, and you're going to dance naked, don't do it. God's not going to be happy, all right? Because that's not what this text is about. This text is about celebrating. It's basically about a couple things very quickly. It is your relationship with God, because this is talking about David's relationship with God, McCall's relationship with God, and, and then the second part of it is how you basically have an attitude toward it. Do you realize that our attitude about worship ought to be positive? Okay, I know you haven't done this in a while, but that'd been a good place for an Amen. All right, there you go. We'll we'll practice it throughout this whole time, all right? We'll keep practicing. I'll give you plenty of time uh, to do it. But the the, the worship, our attitude ought to be that this is a good thing. That's why the Bible says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I hope you were glad this morning when you got a chance to say, hey, we're going to get to be in the house of the Lord together. Man, this is cool, amen? I couldn't hardly sleep, man. I've been as giddy as a little school girl, amen? I've just been so happy about seeing y'all here, knowing people are joining us on live stream. This has just been a great day. So it's talking about our attitude toward the worship. So I want to look at two perspectives today with their relationship with God and their attitude about it. And I want you to examine your heart, allow God to examine you today with your, uh, your relationship with God and your attitude about it. So I want to look first at King David. Now, King David, as we see throughout Scripture, was called the man after God's own heart. Can I tell you that David, after what he did here, this display of worship, he was still considered a man after God's own heart. So he didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't doing anything wrong here. He was worshiping the Lord, and this is what it talked about. So I want to look at a couple things with David. First of all, what was he doing? What was David doing? Well, we see the first thing that says that he was rejoicing before God. Amen? He was rejoicing. He was excited because what had happened was that the the Ark of the Covenant had been captured by the Philistines. It had then been taken and and they sent it back to Israel because of all the, the things that God was doing to the people there in the Philistine area. And they said, man, let's get rid of this thing. Get it out of here. And so they sent it off. And God brought it back into the place. And, and people were afraid of the Ark of the Covenant. And so they left it in Obed-Edom's house. Obed-Edom had the presence of God there. Man, God began to work. And they told David, said, hey, man, we don't need to be afraid of God. We need to get that Ark. We need to get it back here. So David said, man, we need to do that. And so he went and he brought the Ark back. And so what was going on was he was rejoicing that that which represented God, that which represented all things about God was finally coming back to where it was supposed to be. My friends, it's they were finally going to get to be in God's presence again like God desired. And that was an exciting time. So just like us, every time we have an idea of worship, we are to be rejoicing because what are we doing? Well, first of all, we're celebrating God's presence. That's what the Ark of the Covenant represented. God's presence was there. And so, my friends, listen, might I encourage you today that we as God's people, we ought to be celebrating God's presence in our lives. Every morning we ought to wake up and say, thank you, Lord, that you haven't left me. Thank you, God, that you will never forsake me. Thank you, God, that you allow me to worship. Thank you, God, that we're all together here today. My friends, we ought to be rejoicing because of God's presence in our lives today. But not only God's presence, but then we also look at the second thing is God's victory. Do you realize we've been given victory? We've been given victory over sin and death. Wow! Wow! That all that sin that's been in my life, and we sing about it. He who knew no sin became my sin. 
He took it from me. He became it. And what was, now here's where the victory comes, is that he took away my sin, but not only did he take my sin, but he then gave me his righteousness. That's why I'm victorious, because of what he's done for us. So my friends, listen to me. We ought to be celebrating because we're victors today. As a matter of fact, the Bible calls us more than conquerors. So why would we not celebrate? Amen? But not only do we have the idea of celebrating God's presence and God's victory, but the third one is God's promise. Can you understand that God has made a lot of promises to us? And here's the cool thing about God's promises. He's going to keep every one of them. Hey, celebrate His promise that He will never leave us nor forsake us. Praise the Lord. That ought to get some Southern Baptists to say amen. amen. He's never going to leave us nor forsake us. No matter what we do, God will always, His presence will be here through Jesus Christ because He took my sin, I became His righteousness. He gave me a promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He has also promised us that He will meet all of our needs. Amen? That ought to cause for celebration. He made a promise. Hey, listen, we even talked about it a few weeks ago. He has made a promise to us that when he ascended and he disappeared into the clouds, the angels said, hey, this Jesus whom you saw disappear, he will come again one day just in the same manner. My friends, listen to me. The promise is that Jesus is coming again. Amen. Woo! He's coming for us. Another promise is that where he is, there we will be also. That we're going to get to spend an eternity with Jesus. Hey, that's a good promise, amen? But hey, listen, it goes on even more. He's also promised us that those who have gone before us, those whom we may be missing with all of our heart here today, guess what? The promise is they're there waiting on us, and we'll be together again. Woo! Now, I'm telling you what, that gets me excited. I'm getting goosebumps even, and I could go on. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, for all the acts that God has done, if we were to write it down, if we were to keep write all His promises, we wouldn't have enough room in this world to put down all the stuff He gave us. David understood that. David was rejoicing before the Lord. Man, he had a reason to celebrate. And the celebrating is, is something that I don't do real well sometimes. Celebrating is something I think the church has kind of lost an art in. Now, part of mine is I think the reason that sometimes I don't celebrate is it's hard to break from, from my old coaching days. Man, I coached for all those years, and, and the one thing about a coach is, and coach, you probably realize this, is we don't get to celebrate long, because the celebration comes, we win, guess what we got to do the very, very minute after that game is over? We start looking for the next game, we got to start game planning, figuring out how we're going to do it, we can't get too high, can't get too proud of ourselves, and so <clears throat> what happens sometimes is I've lost some of the art of celebration, and I need to get that back. Because we're always looking for more or we're always looking for what went wrong. How can we do it better? And sometimes in the church, we're the same way. Sometimes we'll look and say, well, how many could we have served? Man, do you realize that we averaged over 300 people every Tuesday that we served meals to from First Baptist West of the M28 Ministries? Praise the Lord for that. But if we're not, so we, we ought to celebrate that. Instead of going, well, one, one Tuesday, oh, we only served 250. Oh, man. Do you see where we missed the celebration? We should celebrate 250 people that would have gone hungry that day. We took care of them. Don't be proud of us. Be proud of God and letting him use us. Could have been more. Well, we, we, we had 50 people in our worship service in the first time. Man, we ought to celebrate that. Here we got more than that. We ought to celebrate and said, if, we could, if we're not careful, I'll go in tomorrow. Go, well, boy, how many could we have had? No, praise God what we have here. Let us celebrate. Not that we could have done more, could have served more, could have been, been more, uh, could, have, could have built more, could have built bigger. My friends, listen to me. We as a church need to stop, rejoice before the Lord, and celebrate the things that He's done for us. But I think we've lost the celebratory spirit. And if we will regain the faith of a child, as I talked about in the first service that, that I preached on this, that we'll be able to truly celebrate so what else was he doing the second thing that he was doing was that he was humbling himself he humbled himself 
It wasn't about him or anyone else. It was only about God. Now, we see in here, the Bible talks about him. McCall was upset because he basically stripped down to mere man. My friends, it wasn't that he stripped off his clothing and was running around dancing naked. He wasn't. God would not have been pleased with that. But what he did was he took off the royal robe and became like everybody else. He humbled himself. He was no longer the king. He was just like everybody else. He said, man, I don't want to be king, David, because I know that God has placed me here, but I don't want to walk around and have this dignified look and think about real highly of myself and let, every, let all the peasants, let them all rejoice. Let them be excited because I got more to worry about. No, David said, man, I'm going to humble myself before God. I'm not going to be king anymore for this time. I am going to be just a regular guy worshiping God, knowing that he's blessed. As a matter of fact, in Acts 10 34 it says this then peter opened his mouth and said in truth i perceive that god shows no partiality can i tell you this there's not one of us in here today that ought to feel high about themselves that think that we're something special that we're god's gift to to the church sometimes we as pastors can kind of get that mentality but we're the pastor there are certain expectations of the pastor. I'm not going to act like that. I've got to be dignified. I can't touch the common people. My friends, listen to me. God says, I, I don't care who you are. You're all the same. We need to humble ourselves before God. And sometimes I think the church is not good at humbling ourselves. And we need to be humble before God. And, and David took off that robe. David signified to, to everyone that we are all in this together. We're all working the same thing. We're all going to be celebrating, and it's time for us to rejoice. And why? Why did he do that? He realized God loved him. My friends, can you think about this today? Seriously. The creator of all the heavens and the earth, who put it together with the spoken word, who spoke and it happened. That same God loves us. That, that blows my mind to realize that God loves me. This perfect God, this powerful God, this creator God, this sustainer God, this God who, who is, is absolutely perfect and beyond anything that we could imagine that same god loves me now you you might be thinking well that you deserve it well i know better i know i don't i know me i know what goes on in this brain i know what goes on in this heart i know what's going on in this life and to know that that god loves me my my friends listen to me we need to celebrate the fact that god still loves us and I've told you that you can't do anything to make God love you more than he loves you right now, but you can't do anything to make God love you any less. God loves you. My friend, if you're watching today, I want to tell you, God loves you. We ought to celebrate. And if we were to realize that, if our perspective is fresh, how can we not celebrate? If I could understand and grasp for a moment how much God loves me that he sent his son to die on the cross for me. How can I not celebrate? How can I not rejoice? How can I not be glad? How can I look around and not think that this God is in control of this world and that everything is going to work okay the way he wants it to work? Man, King David, a man after God's own heart, was worshiping God with all that he had, irrespective of men and who else was watching, because it wasn't about him and it wasn't about them, it was about God. My friends, we all need to understand that this morning. Do you know that this worship service wasn't for us? This is for Him. I, I talked about in the first service this morning about uh, the praise team. They were up here performing, and they did a great job, but, uh, and I use the word performing, but they weren't performing, they were worshiping. It wasn't about them, and it wasn't about them singing to you. They were singing to him. You just got to be a part of it. So this is not about us. It's about him. 
And David realized that. And then the second person, very quickly, the second person, McCall, David's wife, the, the, the wife of the king. We look at McCall and we see the same question. What was she doing? We see that, that, that her perspective was not the same as David's. But what was McCall doing? Well, we see the first thing that we looked at, that she was judging. She, the Bible said that she was literally looking down from her window at all that was going on, all the worshiping, and she looked down with disgust at David, what he was doing. She was judging him. My friend, her perspective was not the same as David's. And here's the thing, that if we lose perspective of what God has done for us, we sometimes in the church, if we get too grown up, the church can be very judgmental. Amen? And we can be very degrading to people and say, well, how dare they? We could look at them and say, well, if that were me, I would not ever... How dare they? I can't believe they're doing. My friends, I know in the nine years I've been pastoring here, I've told you many, many times that we ought to be very careful saying stuff like that. We should never say, well, if that were me, I would not. Or if that were me, I would. Or I can't believe they because I would never. Because we don't know the situation of the people we're judging. And probably given the same circumstances they're having to deal with that we don't understand we might have been worse than that only by the grace of god do i get to do what i'm doing but as people who lose their perspective of what god has done for us man we can judge very quickly and she was very very judgmental but not only was that then she was complaining we see that she was judging, and then she complained. Man, she walked, David walked in the house, and man, she unloaded on him. Now, I know none of you husbands know what that's like. You don't get it. But I'm here to tell you by looking at it, and I don't have it either. I don't understand this. I don't know what these are. I didn't think it was a big deal. But then I read it, and apparently it was a big deal that she unloaded on him. Man, she went to town on him told him all sorts of this stuff. And man, she began to complain about why he should be doing what he was doing. How dare you be like that? How dare you get down and show yourself like that? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know who I am? And don't you know that people are going to talk about what you just did? How many times in the church when we lose our perspective or maybe we lose that childlike faith that maybe, maybe we're grown up just a little bit too much and we begin to see things and we begin to hear stuff in the church and we go, wow, can't believe they're doing that. Can't believe they're, he told that joke. I can't believe that song was played. And what we end up doing is we end up complaining so much about stuff. Why would you act that way in this time or this place? My friends, sometimes the church can not only be very judgmental, but sometimes we can complain. Oh my goodness, we can complain. And most of the time that, we, that I find myself complaining... I step back a little bit later and I go, boy, I can't believe I complained about that. That wasn't a big deal. But when we lose our perspective, when we lose that freshness, when we lose that innocence, when we grow up too much, we can complain. So my question is, why? Why was she doing that? Why was David doing it? We asked her why David did what he did. We asked now, why did McCall do what she did? And basically, she had lost her perspective. She had lost that very perspective of that freshness of God, of that mentality about God, of all the things that God had done for her. And basically, here's what she did. She began to focus on worldly attributes. She began to focus on the physical things rather than the spiritual. And now, here's, here's where we as a church get in trouble. When we begin to focus on the physical things rather than the spiritual things. 
when we get more concerned about the physical stuff than the spiritual stuff. We lose our perspective on this, and we begin to look on the worldly attributes. She said, you are the king. I'm looking at you as the king, and the king don't act that way. I am your wife. I don't act that way. We have a reputation to uphold. We have to hold everybody's respect. We have a certain way that we've always done it, and you need to keep doing it that way. We have a certain color carpet that we've had in our church for 50 years, and we don't change that color carpet. I shared with you that uh, there's a lot of churches that have dissension. There's a lot of churches that have been split. And I would dare tell you the majority of those churches did not have, do not have dissension or they have not split over things that were spiritual. It was things that were physical. Things that really didn't matter in the whole eternal perspective. What color carpet? Chairs instead of pews. What color of paint on the walls? What lighting do we use? What what music do we play? Where does the organ sit? Folks, when we get so wrapped up on the physical attributes and we lose perspective of, of, of the spiritual, we're going to be a lot like McCall. So she was wrapped up on the focus of the worldly attributes. But second thing that I think was she was observing rather than participating let me get to that slide well guy, i don't know where we are on that guys sorry about that but uh the last point that we're looking at is that she's observing rather than participating i, I want to share this with you that worship is a participatory event amen you did i i, I pray and, and you remember if you if you've been watching and you folks at home you remember that at the starting of every service i say this please don't sit at your house watching this we have words on the screen for a reason. Because we want you to sing. We want you to participate. That's why we put the words here. We want you to participate. Even in the, the message, I love, listen, I love for you to participate. That would have been a good point. Yeah, there you go. Been a good point for a participatory action. But I want you to participate. Because if all we are doing is observing, we lose the whole meaning of what, we're, what was going on. We lose it. When you think about what church really is, what a church service is, and what goes on, I'll be honest with you, boy, it sounds kind of boring. Because just think, you, you, you walk into a building, you, you, you sit down, and if you don't participate, you just listen to the music for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Then all of a sudden after that, you have a, a guy stand up and he gives a 25-minute presentation. And I'm meaning 25 minutes. I got it. I know. Don't tell me, you're preacher, you're going longer. No, I'm not. My watch hadn't clicked yet. I got time. But you listen to someone talk for about 25 minutes. And then you have a time of that he's trying to encourage you to make it some sort of decision, decide will you follow, will you not. And then you go home, and then today before you leave, we're going to ask you to drop an envelope of money or a check into the plate. Now I'm telling you, if that's what you're doing, man, that don't sound very fun to me. As a matter of fact, if you're going to make me come in and sit down and just sit and, and, and sit there for an hour... Man, I'm going to be bouncing around. My wife's going to be telling me to be still. She's going to be calling Jesus, peace, be still. Because that don't sound fun to me. Oh, but if you're going to allow, and we're going to walk in, and man, we're going to sing together, and we're going to sing some great praises to the Lord, and I get an opportunity to, to sing. 
then I'm going to receive from God some instruction and guidance into my life by, by a message that someone has prepared just so that, 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 that I can receive from that. And then I'm going to get an opportunity to respond to God's call on my life. And then I'm going to get an opportunity to be a part of a ministry by giving of my tithes and offerings. And man, I'm going to have fellowship with people. I'm here to tell you, folks, that sounds good to me. That sounds a whole lot better than just sitting here like nuts on the log for an hour. I don't want to sit anywhere for, for an hour doing nothing. And I want to participate. I see people going to basketball games, football games, any games, sporting events, and they just sit there. I'm thinking, man, why'd you spend all the money? Let me go. I'll go. I'll show you how to cheer. Amen. I'll show you how to cheer. McCall decided rather than to go down where, where God's spirit was moving and participate in that great time, she decided to be an observer. And folks, it changed her perspective. I'm here to tell you, you really want to leave out of here feeling fulfilled? Man, you participate. You feel the freshness of God's Spirit working in your life. Man, that's when you're going to get excited. That's when this won't even seem like an hour. As a matter of fact, dude, when the time is over, you'll look down and say, man, are we through already? Instead of going, boy, praise the Lord, we're finally done. I just want to tell you, in worship, how you respond at the end will tell you what you put into it in the beginning. Because you know what? I'm here to tell you. I don't care what songs we sing. I don't care what message I preach. God's Spirit is in this place. And if you're connected to Him like you're supposed to, this will be a great experience for you today. You will be glad when they said, we're going to be in the house of the Lord. So I want to encourage you today. Examine. What is your perspective in this? Your relationship with God, where is it? How is it? And what is your attitude about worshiping Him? Some of you may be here today, some of you may be watching, and you're saying, I've got nothing. I don't feel what you're talking about, Pastor. I don't know what it's like to truly celebrate the risen Savior then I want, to, I want to ask you today, would you call upon God's name? Would you ask Him, God, why do I not feel that? Why do I not have, why is my life more like McCall than David? Why is my attitude about worship more like hers than his? Why is my attitude about the church more like hers than his? Why is my attitude about God's people more like hers than his? Why is, why is my attitude, why are my discussions, why are the things that I say, why are they more like hers than they are like his? Why? Why was my view of this last hour more like hers than his? I promise you, you ask that question, God will give you your answer. And maybe it is today that you need to have a renewed spirit. Maybe today, here or at home, maybe today you need to call upon God's name and ask Him to forgive you of your sin and to save you. Maybe you've been here in this church for many years. Maybe you've been claiming to be a Christian for many years and you're thinking already, well, what are people going to say? My friends, it doesn't matter what people are going to say because it's not going to be these people you're going to be standing in front of at the end of eternity, for the beginning of eternity. It's going to be God. Doesn't matter what anybody thinks. As a matter of fact, if they're thinking something wrong, that well, I can't believe they've become a Christian now. Look how old they are. Then that's their problem. Maybe they need to have their heart changed. Because I don't care who it is. I don't care how young they are, how old they are. Anytime someone comes to know Jesus, man, we ought to celebrate it. I don't care how long they've claimed it. Celebrate it. So don't let what people are going to think about you change your ability and desire to follow God in salvation. And secondly, you may be here and you say, well, Pastor, I know that I'm saved. But it's, it's been a long time since I've viewed things like this. Then I want to encourage you today that you, you can be 
You can be renewed in your heart. That's a promise that God has given us. So, call upon his name today and say, God, restore back to me the joy that I once felt. God, give me the faith of a child again. God, give me that peace. Give me that encouragement. Give me that desire. Give me that thought of celebration in worship. It's possible. It's there, I promise you. That's the promise God has made for us. Rejoicing and celebrating the Lord for all the things that he has done for us. Here in just a moment, we're going to enter into a time of, of, uh, of praise and worship. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. And as they come, I want you to understand this is going to be a time that we're going to join back into praise and worship. If God is speaking to your heart and you need to call upon his name, would you do that today? Right there where you are at your home or right here in this place. Call upon God today. And if you need someone, we'll pray with you. All you have to do is, is, is get in touch with us. If you're at home and you need someone to visit with, we have people that will be right now on the phone, right next to a phone. If you'll just call our church. If you'll call our church this morning. 536-4227. Very simple. 536 536- 4227, you call, someone will answer. Someone will be praying with you here in just a moment. If you're here right here in this congregation and you need someone to pray with, man, I, social distancing, I, I, I got a mask. If you, if you want me to put a mask on, I'll pray, I'll, I'll pray with you. I just, I just want to know that when you leave out of here, you're saying, God, I have it with you, and that's all that matters. So we're going to sing that song. I want you to sing along or I want you to spend time praying. Or coming forward, whatever God lays on your heart. But let me lead you in prayer, and then the praise team is going to, uh, going to sing, and we're going to ask you to stand and join in with us, okay? Father, as we come this morning, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your peace. Thank you for your promises, and thank you for the victory. And Father, I pray today that as we, as we go here in the, through this next few moments, that people would be responding to your call, And then we would be celebrating one last song that we can sing together. Father, speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?